Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Happy Feast Day. For the important saints of our church, of course, the saints of North America, one of our great saints that we celebrate in this land. Uh, of course, our Metropolitan's name day, so remember him in your prayers as well. The founder of, uh, of course, St. Tico's Monastery. While I was away last week, I had copious amounts of time to read at points, and um, one of the books I was able to pick up was the homilies of St. Gregory Palamas, the book which I honestly thought I would never buy because it's usually like $130. Well, they were selling it for less than half of what it normally is because they've got some deal on it, so I jumped on that and went into my cell and began reading his homily on the widow of Nain. And Saint, we have 64 extant homilies from St. Gregory. And he was remarkably pastoral. We always think of him as this deep theologian, which he was, and capable of expounding on the higher mysteries, which he was. But he was also immensely pastoral and knew the scriptures like few others. This is really, not only because of his education, he was not one who simply knew about God, he was one who knew God from his way of life, who walked with God and lived that life. St. Gregory, in reading this passage, takes it in a place which I probably, well, certainly would not have thought of at first, his heart being that deep. He takes it to the Epistle to the Hebrews, the part where we talk about all those who walked in faith and were sawed asunder, lived in caves, and that passage. And he talks about women receive their dead to life again. He talks about it in light of that, but of course, Paul wasn't talking about the widow of Nain in this passage. He was talking about people like the widow of Zarephath and the Shunammite woman. Relating these people to the widow of Nain. And the stories are quite similar, but yet rather different. In both of those stories, with Elijah and the widow of Zarephath, you have a woman who showed great faith. She led this man to her home while they were in the middle of this terrible famine and drought. All she had was this little bit of flour, this little bit of oil. And realizing that's all she had for her and her son, for her family, she, on faith, allowed the prophet Elijah to partake of this first, trusting that God would make it well. Of course, God did make it well. But in the meantime, her son dies. And as Elijah is off in the distance, of course you know the story, she comes out to him, why did you, you know, do this, come into my home and my son dies, like him, but having faith, knowing she could get him to come, if she does this. Well, he does come. He had to be told about this, keep that in mind. He comes there, he wants everyone removed from him, he goes into solitude really, off to himself, and prays. To God, the only one that can heal, trusting not in princes and the sons of men, only in the one true God. And of course, he works the healing and his son is raised. With Elisha and the widow of the Shunammite woman, the same. She prepares her home for him, she feeds him, she takes care of him, and eventually has to send out to get him. And he comes, he had to be told as well. And he comes. He sends Gehazi away, he goes in there in silence, a good lesson for us with both of these prophets. They draw aside to pray for their needs, to pray to the one true God. The first reaction wasn't to go find the physician, the first reaction was to pray. And he heals the son, raises him up. Both of these women show great faith. Both of these prophets had to be brought, had to be told, had to go aside in silence to pray, a little bit different than our Lord. Our Lord comes into this city without being told this was being done. He knew. He knows our needs. He knows each and every one of our needs before we do, and comes to us readily to heal us and to work our healing. And he doesn't have to go aside to pray. Well, he did so often in the scriptures to teach us how we should act for him. In the middle of this crowd, he doesn't have to send anyone away, even though sometimes he would do so, but take a few of his disciples with him so they could be witnesses. In the middle of this crowd, 
he works healing. He doesn't have to pray because he is God himself. He only commands. Now imagine your widow, your only son is dead. You have nothing of worldly love at this point. You feel totally desolate. And this man walks up and says, two words, weep not. Even you would have thought he was crazy or mean. And you would trust that this is really who he said he was. The Messiah come to help us. And the Lord does command, touches the beard to show that this is real, that he is a physical incarnate being. And the son sits up just by his command. Very different than the other two. He didn't have to be told. He didn't have to pray to himself. He was the true God who comes to work our healing. And this is not the only healing, as we know, the only resurrection that our Lord performed. He raises the daughter of Jairus with a command, Talitha Kumi, little girl, arise. He raises the servant, the centurion, and at his own death, Many walk out of the tombs, as we hear of in the Gospel according to Matthew. Many arise. And he raises Lazarus. So what do we think? All these people are going to die again. Or was it it for each and every one of them? Indeed, they all were about to go to their death again. But God gave us a foretaste of what was to come and what could be. In the general resurrection, when he calls us all up with himself, and he goes into Hades as he has already done, and calls us forth into life, and tells us to weep not. He tells us that each and every day now. That is his message to us, to weep not. Because this isn't it. This death of the flesh here is not it. We must live in such a way as to obtain our salvation, where this is not it, where there is eternity with joy and peace and love and mercy and kindness and light. The sickness is fled away. There is no more weeping over our lost sons and husbands and daughters and wives and family members. And he calls us to that. And Gregory Pondamas goes further and then speaks of the St. Demetrius, of course, was the patron of the city where he was archbishop. Apparently, in this time, they had a seven-day fast preceding the Feast of St. Demetrius. It was a really big deal in the city, which apparently fell aside in the time of the Turkish domination for many hundreds of years, but in recent days is beginning to be revived slightly again. Why? Because that body in that cathedral, which Taylor and I had the blessing of venerating, not just a body. It's not just dead bones and dust. It is imbued with the very grace of the one who said, Weep not, pours forth myrrh and works healings, while Demetrius' soul is sitting at the right hand of God, awaiting that general resurrection when those other people, Jairus' daughter, little of Nain's son, Lazarus, the people that came out of the tombs, will raise up with their bodies and be united to him. When we have St. Tikhon today, if we go to Donskoy Monastery in Russia, we can see his bones. But they're not just bones. They work wonders because of the life that he lived here and in Russia. I was reading some of his homilies last week. They were very relevant today. The things he was calling the people in the church to then, he would be calling them to now. He was very firm and loving. He knew the scriptures very well. He called people to a new way of life. He called them to weep not. He called them to rise up out of their malaise, to follow Christ, to follow that one who can only truly say weep not, to follow that one who can tell us to rise up from our deathbeds, and who truly, indeed, each and every day does come to us and calls us to a new way of life, not to lie on our bier of death, which is what the old man is doing in our souls. He calls us and looks at us and says, 
deep down. Rise up now. Not at the end, rise up now and begin to walk with me, to follow me on this path I'm going to crucifixion, to follow me into resurrection, to follow me to be ascending to the right hand of God the Father in glory. He calls us with good news, brothers and sisters, each and every day, to weep not. The gospel must be good news for us. And these things we have to put aside, while they may be difficult, while they may be hard for us, while they are very much imprinted in our souls, only he can heal. So we must call out to him, Lord, help me. I am perishing. And he looks at us each and every time, at least in my pitiful experience, and says, I will sit there and weep not. Rise up. Walk with me in the newness of life and enter into the joy of the Lord.